with the community of faith at Holy Trinity, Elliott Lake. And we worship in a setting surrounded by spectacular color. In this season of creation, we have focused on the forest and the land and the wilderness. And this morning, we will look at the river. People of God, let us gather at the river of life. In our sorrow, the river offers comfort. In our joy, the river rejoices with us. In our loneliness, the river offers companionship. In our uncertainty and pain, the river offers new life. And let us celebrate together the great gift of water that God has given to us. Thanks be to God. For thousands of years, First Nations people have walked on this land. And their relationship with the land is at the center of their lives and their spirituality. And we are gathered on the lands represented by the robinson huron Treaty 61 of 1850, the traditional territory of the Serpent River and Mississauga people. And we acknowledge their stewardship of this land throughout the ages. And may we live with respect on this land and live in peace and friendship with its people. As the river of life flows through the city of God, so may God's love flow through our lives. May the Christ light remind us of the Spirit's flow that enables abundant living. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, be with us today in our joy and sorrow, anticipation and exhaustion. Lead us to your life-giving water so that we may be renewed to carry out your transformative work in the world. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from the book of Revelations, chapter 22, verses 1 to 5. Then the angel showed me the river of life, of the water, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb to the middle of the street of the city. And on either side of the river is the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit producing its fruit each month. And the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there anymore, 
But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. And they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will be no more night, they need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And the next scripture is from the book of Psalms, Psalm 104, verses 27 to 33. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. And when you give to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. And when you send forth your spirit, they are created. And you renew the face of the ground. And may the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works, who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. And then from the book of Matthew, verses, or sorry, chapter 28, verses 1 to 10. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it, and his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow. For fear of him the guards shook and became like dead men, but the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised, as he said. Come see the place where he lay. And then go quickly and tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead. And indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. And there you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. And may God add God's blessing to the reading of God's word. As most of you know, my previous pastorate was in Espanola, a town that was only accessible from the north by coming down Highway 6 and going over the bridge uh, over the Spanish River, which gushed at the dam there at Domtar. And in winter, I found it particularly beautiful. The ice that formed from the spray of the falling waters was sculpted like tall standing windswept drifts. And in spring, the waters rose swirling white and Patricia Drohan Bordenaba, she's a re newspaper reporter, and she wrote an article about the organization called the Friends of the River, of the Spanish River. And she outlined their work of cleanup of that river. In 1994, a group of concerned citizens, they banded together to form that organization in order to restore, preserve, and celebrate the majestic Spanish River. It begins at Bisco Tasting west of Sudbury and it ends at the town of Spanish about, I don't know, little more than half an hour from here. Industrial development had taken its toll on the river and because of this group's work, the river is once again alive with fish and other life. In 2013, the group disbanded as they had completed their work of restoring the river. And several of my former parishioners, a lot of forestry guys actually, had given countless hours to this project. And one in particular was the late Bill Blight, who was affectionately known as Mr. Spanish River. In the 1980s, Canada and the US, they identified 43 areas of concern around the Great Lakes, one of which was the Spanish River. And so the Kalamazoo Vegetable Parchment Company, KVP, it was a Michigan company that had purchased the mill in Espanola in 1943. And they had left the Spanish River polluted with toxic chemicals 
that all but destroyed what was once a very booming fishing waterway. In the, in the 1950s, as a result of some lawsuits, some cleanup of the river had begun, and there was increasing awareness of environmental concerns. However, because of business partnerships between government and industry, that prevented the, the total cleanup of the river. In 1983, there was a disastrous toxic spill at the mill, which was then by, owned by E.B. Eddy Forest Products, the company for which I tree planted, and it destroyed that ecosystem all the way from the falls at the mill right down the river to Lake Huron. The spill deprived the fish of oxygen. And Friends of the Spanish River, it's an all-volunteer nonprofit. They partnered with m &R, with all the local townships along the Spanish River, the Ontario Ministry of the Environment, and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canadian Coast Guard. And it took 19 years for the Spanish to be cleaned up and restored to good health. An accompanying photo on the article showed the junk that they retrieved from the river. Bicycle, tires, drums, computer parts, steering wheel, car parts, a doll, cement blocks, and other debris. And that's just one little section. Decades earlier, no vegetation grew along the shoreline and it looked like an open sewer. And at that time, the government felt that jobs were more important than caring for the environment. And so little care was given to what toxic substances were spewed out into the river from the mill. So part of the cleanup process also involved mining companies in Sudbury and area reducing their pollutants, heavy metals in particular, all of which, which flowed into the Spanish. Over a period of seven or eight years, muskie were reintroduced to the river. In the fall, thousands of fingerlings, which were about eight inches long, they were relocated to the river. And by the end of that seven or eight years, the muskie were reproducing on their own. Later, cormorants returned, which was another sign of a healthy eco-balance, as they could now feed on what the river offered. Although the Friends of the Spanish River, that group has been disbanded, that disbanded their work of restoring, preserving, and celebrating it was now complete. However, now environmental scientists go up and down that river each week to monitor the river's health. Domtar, which bought out Ibietti, they purchased an oxygenator so that the oxygen could be put into the water during those years that were dry and not much water running over the falls. The restoration of the Spanish River to a healthy waterway teeming with life it's a local success story. It's a story of collaboration and hope, a story of healing of the creation. It's also a resurrection story. Water is essential to life. It keeps all living things hydrated, enables all green things to grow, and water is home to all that swims in it, providing food for aquatic creatures, for birds and animals and humans. Water must flow. When it doesn't, it becomes stagnant and loses some of its life-giving abilities. Sometimes, I think, in the developed world, we take our water for granted. We turn on a tap and outflows the water. Some years ago, a parishioner wrote up a Lenten forfeit calendar every day on that calendar had an action and based on that action you had to put a certain amount of money into a, an envelope. And so one day's action stood out for me. It was to go around one's home and yard and count the number of taps that you had to give thanks and then put into the envelope say 10 cents or a quarter for every tap you had. It made you think what riches you had simply with a tap. In some African countries, people, usually women, walk, can walk up to two hours just to get water and then walk back with water in a container perhaps on their head or on their back or in their arms. So we might bellyache this coming week that after the town's flushing of our water lines, that water might run brownish for a bit or that gee whiz, we have to go and change the day that we're going to do our laundry. We have it so good. 
As the Spanish River story illustrates, industries and humans pollute waters. Climate change, global warming, as we have heard touched on in the previous three creation sermons, they all have an impact on water, which then impacts all creatures upon the earth. Overconsumption of water, wasting water, this threatens water supplies as well. And you know, it's kind of hard when we live in a, in a place that is surrounded by water, it's hard sometimes to think about it. The bottled water industry has a negative impact in some locations where water is drawn deep from within the earth. There are many factors that threaten water supply. The state of California has had numerous droughts, and they're not just one year, some of them are five and six years if you look back down. 80% of its water consumption goes to support agriculture and 20 goes for human consumption. Droughts lower the water table, they dry up the lakes, the streams and the aquifers. The land itself begins to drop as the underlying water is lowered. I wonder if we stopped purchasing Californian grown fruits and vegetables and wines whether that would lower their consumption significantly. And then there's the whole thing, well then there's less, you know, less jobs. So I don't know what it's all, how we balance all of this. The world's textile industry is a serious polluter of water. To produce one kilogram of fabric, typically 200 liters of water are consumed in washing the fiber, bleaching, dyeing, and then cleaning the finished product. And the high usage of the water is not so much the issue, but it's the wastewaters that are not treated to remove the pollutants before they are released from the factory. 20% of all fresh water pollution is made by textile dyeing and treatment, consequently adding up to the aquatic life toxicity. Substances such as formaldehyde, chlorine, and heavy metals are disposed into water bodies and they are consumed in daily activities by a large number of people. I'm wondering if we paid more attention to the t-shirts that we buy, whether they were made in Bangladesh or India, and we stopped buying them because they were so cheap, whether we could influence that industry for the better. Textile workers are paid next to nothing and industries do not treat their water before releasing it into the environment. And if we as Canadian purchasers made wiser choices with more developed environmental consciousness, then perhaps the peoples of those less developed countries would have more of a chance to have clean water to drink and have plenty of it. As I was thinking about this, that this morning and I was walking from the living room down the hall to the washroom, my eye went to my sewing room and I have meters and meters of fabric and I went, hmm, wonder what I should be doing with this. I'll use it up. In preparing this creation sermon series, what may, has made an impression upon me is that the choices that we make here in our everyday lives, they have an impact upon peoples so far away from us. Water must flow and water must flow freely. The spirit must flow that all living things on earth, in the waters, or in the air may have life and have it abundantly. The beautiful picture painted at the beginning of the last chapter in Revelation, the last chapter in the Bible, is one of life flowing water. The water of life flowing clear and bright as crystal from the throne of God down the middle of the street of the holy city. On each side there are those trees bearing fruit in season and the leaves are for the healing of the nations. It's a picture of future things. In reality, it's a picture of the spiritual life, where the spirit flows clearly and cleanly through the center of our lives, supporting life in abundance and enabling healing for all creation. The creation story begins with the Garden of Eden, where the rivers flow plenteously in all directions, and life eternal flows with a river running through the New Jerusalem. Life flows when we are in tune with the movements, the promptings of the Spirit. My former spiritual director from North Bay once gave me an outline of how to prepare 
for that moment of spiritual direction. And among others, there were questions to help you sense the flow of your life. Questions to help us tune in where the Spirit is at work in our lives, guiding, inspiring, enabling, teaching us. Yet there are times when we can feel stuck, as if we cannot hear the whispers of the Spirit. And then I think we need to be patient, trusting that the Spirit will flow in the fullness of time. The Gospel passage tells us the resurrection story. And there are lots of emotions, fear and confusion and joy. And the heavenly messengers and Jesus tell the disciples to fear not. And those disciples, they can't get their head around the empty tomb, the resurrection, and that Jesus speaks to them. Fear is running. Yet God knows us and encourages us through God's word not to fear. Let us not fear the flow of the Spirit flowing through our lives, through the church, that new life may flow, that all creation may be healed. <clears throat> this spring, after the Easter lilies had bloomed in their full splendor and had died down, I cut them back and I planted them in a flower bed. And over the summer, I watched them slowly sprout up with new green. And a week or so ago, I was cutting back some burgundy-colored daisy type of plant that were past their prime, and I discovered three lily stems, each with a bud on it, and one now in bloom. In this season of summer giving way to autumn, there stands a bloom that shouts of resurrection, that sings of new life flowing through us by the Spirit, and I am grateful. Thanks be to God. Rivers flow Spirit of life, flow through us. Water of life, you are a source of renewal and strength. Help us to become vessels carrying your life-giving water to restore all of creation. Source of life, you offer us your love and healing so that we may help to repair this broken world. May we walk gently on the earth and lead us beside the still waters that will calm our souls. As we live with respect on this land, 
May we learn from Indigenous peoples and their knowledge of the healing properties of various plants. Spirit of life, come to us that we might know the power of your resurrection and may that flow to enable transformation. In Jesus' name we pray. And we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Along this highway 108 and all around Elliott Lake and beyond, we are blessed with water. Water in which to swim or in which to kayak, canoe, or boat. Water in which to fish. The lapping of the water's waves to listen to. Water that reflects autumn's spectacular colors. Water to which to say fish and animal life. And our taps never run dry. What abundance we have. So let us give to God from the abundance that is ours in whichever way we can. Let us pray. Life-giving God, through the years our MS dollars or gifts with vision have helped to drill wells, wells in communities that otherwise people may have to walk for hours to draw water. We thank you that our gifts can enable that. Receive the gifts we offer this day. Gifts of money, gifts of music, gifts of compassion and companionship, gifts of vision that your creation might live into wholeness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sing in the rain and jump in the puddles. Give a cup of cold water in Jesus' name. Extend a leaf in healing. Give thanks for the fresh running water. And now maybe you be blessed with the rivers flow, the spirits flow, and love's flow. <laughs> 